Thank you, Pauline, and uh, thanks everyone for being here, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. This is also my first ICRA, um, and you know I come from. You know, this is this is normally my first slide because I, I think about human movement as this very complex interaction of neural control and biomechanics with a hierarchical embedded feedback loops that we are trying to dissect using very simple motorized devices, uh, dynamic modeling, feedback control. But I'm not going to talk about this, but this when you when you, people ask me to model uh, a human behavior for the purposes of human-robot interaction, uh, I say I, I don't know how to do that. Um, and so, in fact, uh, being here, somebody uh, actually from Neville and Dagmar's uh, reminded me uh, of a paper that I wrote that I think is very... that I wrote uh, when I was asked to shed some light on, you know, how do you model Whole body movements, and the answer was, I don't, I don't really know how to do it, but I know why it's hard. Um, and so, and part of it is, especially in these whole body movements, we don't have a, a, a target or a cursor. We, we really don't even understand what the goals of those movements really are. Um, and that the models that we generate usually highlight one, one aspect: of mechanics or control, and they're not provable. Um, they just demonstrate one way that the system could be working. Um, and, and when we get it to work or to produce a nominal behavior, um, it, it usually reveals more about the model that we built rather than the humans. Um, and so my, my main message is that we really have to embrace this complexity and think about how to combine uh, well-developed models with uh, experiments of human movement that actually try and uh, test hypotheses. And so I thought, well, we could, we could, all right, that's not going to work. Just use that. We could just turn this into why is understanding human robot interaction so hard? And, and again, we don't understand what the goals are. And uh, a lot of things that I see are like, we have a robot, we had to interact with a human and it worked. I'm like, well, that's, that's great, but it's really telling us one of the many ways in which the human system can adapt itself to achieve uh, different goals. Um, and, and, and some of the things we've talked about, it, you know, a lot of it reveals more about what are the constraints and limitations of the robot rather, rather than person. So I'm, I'm just going to advocate thinking a little bit more about designing uh, experiments of humans and robots together to try and uh, test generalizable hypotheses about movement. And I'm not going to claim that we've advanced a whole lot, but I'm going to show you some examples of how we have <coughs> tried to address these types of questions, looking at uh, human-robot interaction, human-human interaction, and some other assistive devices and ways of considering gait, uh, whole body movements. Um, so uh, I started a project that involved Charlie Kemp looking at trying to develop intuitive physical interactions to help how people walk, and this was inspired by a robot that uh, they had developed where you hold it by the hand and a nursing assistant can lead it around uh, obstacles. And we said, that's great, but again, this was something that works, and we don't really know what about this system actually makes it intuitive or easy to use. And ideally, what we'd like to have is not a human that adapts to whatever the robot does, especially if you're talking about an impaired population, but um, trying to get robots that work sort of out of the box and take advantage of human, what the human expects, what's intuitive to the human. Um, and, and in this way, the robot interaction could feel more naturalistic, uh, wouldn't really require training, um, and uh, we could get principles to sort of optimize what are the aspects of that human-robot interaction um, that, that are useful and how can we ultimately get the robot to adapt to what the human is. So um, one of the things is that we wanted to look at cooperative human-human interactions. Uh, since this is something we do all the time, we carry tables together, we uh, help people stand up, we dance. And um, we, we thought we wanted to look at a behavior that didn't involve any visual feedback. So we're really only relying on physical human interactions. And this becomes very difficult to study, because what are the goals when you're traveling? carrying a table together. 
Am I trying to increase my load, decrease and help the person? These are very difficult things to write down in an equation. Um, and so we actually have to discover what they are. But if it works, then we can propose that the force interactions have to contain information about the online performance of the two individuals, uh, provide communication between the two, and also reflect some of the motor skill or capability of, of the partner. Um, and, and we found that these, this was something that was missing um, in the literature. So the first thing we did was think about, well, what kind of behavior should we study uh, to, to learn about this? And our collaborator, Madeline Hackney, has developed this uh, uh, partner, adapted partner dance to improve balance and gait in Parkinson's disease. And having participated in this class, it's really interesting to see how much can be done with the eyes closed. And you can tell what's happening, and I can tell somebody what to do. And so these cues are really um, conveying some, some motor goals. And those motor goals are fairly explicit because we have a pattern that we're supposed to <coughs> achieve. Um, and we know that this involves some long-term motor skill acquisition. And we could identify experts and novices, because if you get novices to do this task, what do we really learn? Because we don't, they don't really know what it's supposed to be. Um, so we uh, were able to take the robot that Cody, there's a mecha, uh, humanoid uh, mobile manipulator, and it turns out that the sort of admittance controller and the, the uh, compliance in the arms lent itself to sort of the robot following Madeline, who's a, a professional dancer and a rehabilitationist. Um, and we wanted to turn this into kind of a research project to say, what should the robot be like to be intuitive? And so we invited a bunch of highly expert partner dancers to come in and evaluate the robot as a follower uh, based solely on the forces at the hand. So they're blindfolded, uh, so they can't see what the robot's doing. They're walking back and forth in, in a very simple pattern. And what we did was say, well, can we alter the robot? And then can the, ro e the they're going to be able to walk with it, but can the experts tell us? what aspects make it feel better or worse. And we, we chose two different uh, gains for the, the following velocity in relation to the forces of the hand, as well as two stiffnesses of the arms, just trying to maximize the range. And we developed a questionnaire uh, that was designed to probe uh, the, how the subjective experience of the, of the dancers in understanding motor intent, motor performance, and the motor skill. So we were trying to really emulate a human with the, with the robot. And, and we get data that looks something like this, where you get the looking top down uh, on the robot and the human. They walk backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. We can track the relative velocities. And we can look at the forces in between uh, at, at the hands, the interaction forces. So one of the takeaways is that um, the subjective experience uh, was was actually associated with some objective biomechanical measures, which can really help us try and design uh, interactions. And the better motor attempt was uh, improved with shorter uh, temporal lags, which they could, they could sense through the, the forces. And bo better motor performance, in this case, was smaller interaction forces. Um, and we, we looked at this and said, OK, is this, does this look like what people do when they're dancing? And the question is, uh, we, don't, we don't know the answer to that because nobody's actually uh, measured it and published it. There are people who have measured it but not published it. Um, so we really didn't know, have any basis for evaluating how, real, how much like a person this was. And it turns out that some of the other modeling we wanted to do, we really couldn't do because the, of the performance of the robot was somewhat limited and didn't always achieve the stiffnesses and sort of the admittance gain that we wanted to. So it was a tool for probing humans still was the human more adapting to the shortcomings of the robot and the robot really helping us identify uh, the humans. So the next thing we, of course, did was to look at physical human, human interactions uh, during stepping, where uh, we have a force, uh, just an ATI, a force transducer and generating a, a stepping pattern forward and backward, but also a pseudo-random pattern that we had the leaders learn uh, uh, so that uh, we could look at what happens when 
subjects didn't know what to expect. Um, and the questions were really simple. How large are the forces? So how do we get question or attention? Um, and you know, does it is it affected by by motor skill? So we, we brought back partnered answers, but we also got you know college students off of campus to try and do this. Um, and so here's what like an experiment looks like. Again, they're blindfolded. Uh, only the leader hears the beat because that simulates what the robot was doing, and we were able to look at the sort of coordination between two people just from the hands. And these are, these look like two novices to me. <laughs> All right, so we were surprised at how small the interaction forces were, and of course this, what I'm showing you, they're walking back and forth in a very predictable uh, pattern, and you can see the forces here, this is five newtons. Up, up and down, and, and this is partly because they're sort of learning that they have to go forward and backwards. Um, however, these forces are similar to what Charlie Kemp had previously measured in like a shaving task of sort of the preferred range, and so it might be that the human sort of uh, haptic system has a, a range of sensitivity in which more information can be, can be passed and you don't want to exceed that. So we're, we're thinking that that's why the forces are limited uh, uh, to these smaller ones. They're really small relative to how much it takes to push somebody. And so again, this emphasizes that these are communication cues. They're not really mechanically altering the person. They're a cue for the person to change their behavior. And interestingly, the, the experts had much had higher peak forces than the novices when they were together. So this sort of goes back to what Dagmar was saying, is that you might want better communication, more predictable. I want my message to get through if I'm an expert rather than to reduce the amount of force that I'm having to use. Um, and and the, the adaptation and learning was also very interesting. And since Dagmar introduced this, this is good. This is multiple trials of our pseudo-random task. And what we did was we looked at the distance uh, between the two people and we, we measured spatial error, which is basically how much variability there was between the two individuals, which we know from our previous work is something, even though uh, the dancers can't see that distance, they can feel it, and the trials in which that error is lower are the ones that they deem to be better. Um, so the experts um, reduce their spatial error over trials. The novices reduce their error to a lesser degree over trials. Um, and when the experts were paired with the novices, the learning did not happen. <laughs> so this was really interesting because if you're trying to teach a skill with a robot, you really have to change what you're doing depending on what the prior expectation or history of that person is and what they're expecting. And in fact, the experts were, were sort of, this is a histogram of, of forces their, their peak forces out at these extremes were getting larger as the trials progressed. And in the novices, those peak forces were getting smaller as the trials progressed. So, uh, so again, one, one size may not fit all. We really have to know what population we're dealing with, what they're expecting. And maybe the novices actually need to learn what this communication language might be that the uh, experts don't already know. Okay, so um, so you know we we had a team looking at these human human uh, human robot interactions, and there you know we have a lot of data, and this is very hard to analyze. But I, I wanted to show you a spin-off project in which uh, we actually had some intuition about walking, and we're able to develop a device that was intuitive. Um, so this is work by Hyun Sung Song and Se Hoon Ha with Carrot. Here in Lou, where we developed this sort of energy recycling assistive stairs. Um, and they asked me to help them validate that this was actually providing a beneficial effect to people. Because again, you can walk on it and say, this feels good, okay, that's great. So, how do we go about doing that? Um, so, here's the principle, and this was in part, inspired in part by some of the work by Steve Collins with the uh, assistive exoskeletons that store and release energy. 
And in fact, it was Karen Liu who wanted to help her mother walk up the stairs because she's very fit, but she was having, did, uh, as she was aging, uh, not wanting to ascend and descend stairs. So Yunsung developed this very clever device uh, in which you walk down stairs where normally you're losing, you're ha actually having to do negative work. Um, and uh, when you do that, you load a energy into a spring. And then when you walk back up the stairs, uh, that uh, energy from the spring is released back to the person. Okay, so this is a video of, uh, of it working. Um, and interestingly, it's, it's really cheap. It really has just like an Arduino and some springs and some pressure sensors and very simple lodging. Um, I also thought this was not going to work. It was going to be dangerous. But it turns out that it's actually quite comfortable to walk on because you can see it sort of cushions you on the way down. You, um, you don't have to lower the body uh, as, you, as you go down the stairs. Uh, which is actually one of the more uh, dangerous aspects of going downstairs when people tend to fall. So, um, so we want to test, like, does, does it work? And the, the typical way that you might design this experiment is to have people walk, so we can lock down the treads, have people walk, and then we turn it on and we see, okay, does it work? So. Um, here we're, I'm showing you, you know, one measure of like how much work does the knee have to do uh, while you're walking on the stairs unassisted versus assisted. And you can see even walking on these unassisted stairs, there's quite a bit of variability of time. People like learning to do stairs or these particular stairs, even though you put them at a standard height. And then you turn it on um, and you see that that positive knee work goes down. Now, one of the problems is that these two conditions may not necessarily be comparable to each other. So uh, as, a, as a biomechanist, I'm always very suspicious about these results. So I said, well, what you have to do is um, extend this period of time to make sure that people aren't learning. So are you, are you studying the immediate effects of interacting with these stairs? Are people learning how to take advantage of it? Unfortunately, what we showed is that this, this curve is pretty flat, so hopefully that means it's fairly intuitive and they're not having to change the way they walk in order to be able to take advantage of these stairs. Um, and so we evaluated the work at the end of this first learning period, uh, training or period on unassisted stairs and then over a longer period using the stairs. And then what you do is you turn off the assistance and, and you can see that they immediately go back up to using more work. Um, and that's still not good enough, so you might say, okay, that works. Uh, but as a skeptical human movement scientist, I said, well, there's a lot of aspects of walking here that might have differed here. So it turns out they were walking more slowly. So when people walk more slowly, do they naturally just generate less work at the knee? Um, and so we, after the trials, then had to do a speed match control on the unassisted stairs to make sure that we weren't just claiming it, it wasn't just an artifact of uh, how people change their gait. And it turns out this was beneficial for us because people were actually doing more work when they're uh, going up the stairs when they're walking more slowly. Okay, so that, that was really critical. And then it turned out that we all, another reason that we had to have so many different control conditions is that when we were looking at um, stair ascent, and stair descent, the duration of time that the foot was contacted with the ground was also uh, different. And so it could be that the differences in work were really just the amount of time that people had to actually uh, perform the task. So it turns out for uh, stair ascent, we had to use, um, we, we compared the step durations. Uh, and we had to use the sort of speed match control, which is, whereas during descent, we um, had to use the sort of pre-assistance pre uh, condition. And, and by, by doing this carefully, we were able to then show that uh, you could you reduce the amount of work done at the knee by about 38% uh, going up the stairs. And perhaps more importantly, as I said, uh, in, descent, the um, <coughs> negative work done by the trailing an uh, ankle, which is usually used to lower your body against gravity, which is actually the more difficult biomechanical test, 
uh, is decreased by 26%. And in fact, this part, it felt like people said they're walking on clouds. Or they're sort of, it, it, it let you uh, go down. And that was actually unexpected, because we really think about the difficulty of going upstairs more than downstairs. But people, people mostly fall, or fall quite a bit when, when descending stairs. Okay. Um, and, the, and the good thing is this is really cheap sort of design. There's no motors. Uh, you can put it on top of normal stairs. Um, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> okay, so uh, so here we were able to reduce energy generation and dissipation in a way that people didn't have to learn, um, and, and we leverage principles of human gate biomechanics. And uh, but getting back to you know how would we know whether we were altering how people walk during these human robot interactions or human human interactions, we really had to go back and say, how would we evaluate this? We can't get a model to simulate a person. Uh, can we get better measures of what's happening to the people uh, when they're walking? And so this is work of Nick uh, who that was uh, presented as a poster here, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about why, why we wanted to do this. So, you know, people walk differently, it turns out. We can, we can plot trajectories uh, and uh, one by one, but the work that we have done has really led us to understand that uh, there's a lot of coupling at both the biomechanical level, if we just look at rigid body dynamics, uh, but as well uh, with the sort of control of multiple muscles across the limb, and these are going to vary across different diseases. We show they vary in uh, dancers and non-dancers. And so again, there's both neural and biomechanical coupling mechanisms that uh, that cause joints to be uh, uh, joint movements to be related to each other that we can observe. And I, I posit that we can actually uh, learn a lot about how people move by watching them that we can't yet encapsulate in a mathematical kind of description of movement. So we've been trying to get these models to simulate these these patterns, but I wanted to take a data-driven approach and say, let's, we have measurements of all kinds of different people walking. What can we extract from that beyond sort of the mean and standard deviation of the joint angle over, over time? Um, and so what we did is we have uh, data of healthy people walking on a treadmill for short bouts of time, less than a minute. And uh, we wanted to do a sort of an unsupervised, I call small data analysis. Um, using uh, this idea of switching linear dynamical systems, which again I also didn't think would work. Um, and uh, what, what we did was, so you record, so you see somebody walking and we have their joint angles and we can read them out in time. And then what you can do is fit a uh, autonomous uh, linear system and what it does is that you get four of them that correspond to different phases of gait, single support, double support, left and right. Um, and during gait, these transition from one linear system to the next uh, based on uh, a markup chain. So we learn the transitions and we learn uh, the state transition matrices. Uh, and uh, sort of post hoc, we can look at these models and say, oh, that happened to coincide with uh, single support and double support. And in fact, the transitions uh, coincide with when we see force plate events that we didn't put in. Um, and then because we have the human sort of model here, we can actually add, add inputs where we stimulate uh, a muscle in this case, or it could be an exoskeleton or any other type of interaction, and show how that changes. Now, one of the interesting things here is that this uh, description, description, a dynamic description of a gate in these different phases gives me uh, a way to explicitly understand uh, joint coupling. So here I have each uh, joint angle. So this would be the joint angle of the next time step. Uh, and it's a, a linear combination of the joint angle at the previous two time steps. So if I read this row here, it basically tells me all the dependencies of a particular joint angle on all of the other joints. Okay. So that means that the, the joints aren't going independently. They are actually coupled. Left knee flexion uh, <coughs> depends on left hip flexion. It depends on left ankle adduction. It depends on 
uh, let's see, right angle adduction. And so we've described this coordination pattern between the two limbs. Um, and it turns out that these patterns are uh, individual specific and uh, we can uh, perturb uh, them. So if you look at the group data, you see a much stronger diagonal suggesting that these uh, kinematics are independent, but in fact, each person has their own sort of specific uh, uh, coupling <coughs> matrix that might tell us something about you know, how they learn to walk or what kind of uh, motor impairment they have. And you can actually take these models and do sort of long time horizon predictions uh, of joint angles where now, once we've learned the models, we take this, the transition, gate transitions times over a gate cycle, and we give the model the pose at each of those four time points. And what we can do is simulate uh, the, the trajectory of each joint angle between the two uh, during that gate phase. And we update it with information and we simulate that. So you can see here, these two trajectories our data plus our individual specific model. And uh, this other trajectory is the one predicted off of a group model. So this really highlights that you, you really need to have an individual specific model. We can learn it on 45 seconds of data. And we can characterize uh, sort of these motions. And, we, and here's an input. This is when we stimulate a muscle. Um, and that can also be characterized as a, multi, a mapping from an uh, 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 on-off input into a multi-joint coordination pattern. Um, and that is what is enabling us to think about how, how you might adapt uh, an input or to control this complex system that we maybe don't understand from a mechanistic perspective, but can describe a little bit better here. So um, with that, uh, so we're trying to build a dynamical representation. Whoops, I'm missing a slide. Let's see if it's there. Here. To go back and try and see if we can try this again to look well-controlled physical human-human robot interaction and human uh, human interaction to, to look at some principles of gait. So, so one thing you might think about is perceptual acuity. Uh, we, how well do I have to design my robot if people actually can't tell the difference between certain angles of force? Uh, build a dictionary of force interactions uh, for motor cooperation based on these forces at the hand. Um, and then also maybe look at EEG signals to see whether these physical and human robot interactions are perceived as helpful or harmful. So with that, uh, I just here's my messages again about you know trying to think about human robot and human human interactions by uh, uh, really coming up with experiments that really probe uh, uh, the interactions between the two. So with, with that, I um, just want to thank my lab and funding and for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for like one or two questions. Yes. I'm quite interested in the talk. And uh, in fact, you said why you stick to this kind of Gaussian kind of space? If you introduce this kind of non Gaussian space, I would say that uh, that, that might work better. <laughs> Excuse my word. But still, you say everybody talks about the Gaussian space. You, see, you talk about Gaussian space, this kind of unit. But it's a unitless, this kind of non Gaussian space. I, I would say that's my kind of feeling. I'd like to have your comment on that. Because if it's a non Gaussian, it's something like that, something bit different, you see. You can get rid of this kind of, and you see, uh, how should I say, you see sure. these kind of things. So there's all, all kinds of, I, I, I can't answer this question very well, but I do have a colleague looking at learning and whether or not our priors are Gaussian or non Gaussian, and yeah. whether we represent this as Gaussian or non Gaussian will actually change the principles of how we, we adapt, and we might find some, some different local minima. I, uh, we always start with the simplest model that we can, and when we can't fit our data, then we start to add in uh, nonlinearities that we hope are informed by what we get out of uh, how the, the human sort of bio biological system. So yeah. it, it is it is certainly possible, but it's always difficult to find which ones are the ones that actually uh, work for us. But it, we, we are just on the beginning edges of this, so we, we really picked a, a, a a dumb way to, to look at things. Just a short addition. Kind of pro, pro, pro proprioception, this kind of thing. It's deep inside. We have this kind of basic kind of feelings. And it's not kind of unitless. And it's a how you feel within yourself. Deep inside, proprioception. Yes. This kind of thing. And I think this kind of thing works very well if you introduce this kind of 
what's going on inside the inside the inside sure the so it, it so some of my work is actually aimed at a biophysical model of the sensory yeah. signals that arise yeah. and uh, but I'm sure no one here wants to do it it involves muscle cross bridge kinetics spiking neuron models and things like that so, so we don't have principles yet that we can we can tell you uh, one of the ideas is that muscle spindles that are generally thought to be kinematic sensors are actually kinetic sensors uh, of force and, and maybe even error sensors integrating both my motor attention with the sensory feedback that I actually get back because these uh, muscle spindle organs actually have um, a muscle in it, an, an actuator in it. So there is some computation that's happening there that, um, that is comparing what I expect to what I actually get. Mm -hmm. We can take one more question. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, regarding this, that, that, that this experience, experiment that you have, so I have a couple of quick questions. One is that if you look at also the heat uh, force and energy in terms of like the work, I mean, and also the second question is that uh, do you think that uh, part of it, like at the same time that you're assisting the user, uh, can also that kind of actuation affect the <coughs> so on the, on the other side, the user may uh, use more energy and provide more work to stabilize yeah. the posture. Yeah, so uh, one of the things, we did look at all the joints, it just I'm showing the most salient results. Uh, and so they're sort of most mostly in the hip and the ankle, but there are changes in the hip, uh, sorry, in the knee and the ankle, but there are changes in the hip uh, as well. Um, we're looking at total network and we're not looking at sort of muscle co-activation that doesn't actually generate measurable external work. Um, so it could be that people are using more energy. Uh, anecdotally though, it's actually really um, seems to be the opposite, but proving that it's sort of more stable is, is quite difficult. But because you step out and you actually have a support right away when you're going down, uh, you don't have to do this lowering of the body uh, with, this, with your leg behind you, which is quite difficult. So instead you have a double support right away. So in that sense, you're much more stable because you have two points of contact during the entire descent, uh, uh, descent phase. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's likely that uh, people, uh, it's, it's easier you know, for people to use the stairs going down. We didn't measure metabolic energy or anything like that, which is something that you can do, but you have to have people go up and down the stairs a lot uh, to even be able to measure those changes. Thank you, thank you.